Hello, my name is Maddie Jalbert. I am a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Washington and the Center for an Informed Public. And I uh, have a background in social and cognitive psychology. Hi, my name is Kate Starbird. I am an associate professor at the University of Washington in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering. And I am a co-founder and the current director of the Center for an Informed Public. And today we are going to be talking about why we fall for misinformation. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get things started. So one thing to consider when asking why do we fall for misinformation is to ask, how do people decide if something is true? And so there are two main ways in which people can do this. One way they can do this is by carefully analyzing the information. So you can think about, is there evidence for this information? Uh, did I hear it from an expert source? Uh, does everything, is everything logical and does it make sense? The other way that people can do this is by using their intuition. So you can think about whether or not something feels true. So does this information feel true? You can think about those gut feelings. Um, you can also think about whether the information source feels trustworthy. So you can say, does this information come from a source that feels trustworthy? Um, and those are two examples of using intuition. And so just to set the stage with an example, let's say you are on Twitter or social media and you come across the claim that the unicorn is the national animal of Scotland. So you might look at this claim and think about it carefully. Do, is there evidence for this? Is this consistent with the other things I know? Uh, is this, there an expert source? Or you can look at and say, does this feel true? Is this something that seems right? Um, and, and go with that gut feeling. Now, when thinking about feelings of truth, one of the really important factors is how the information feels to process. So I'll give you an example, but information can feel easy or difficult to process. So say you're asked um, to read the Declaration of Independence. It's probably not gonna feel very easy. It's gonna feel difficult. The, the print is gonna feel hard to read. The language is going to feel difficult. You're not really gonna know necessarily everything they're talking about. And that's going to feel really difficult. Information can also feel easy. So you can think about say, clicking through Buzzfeed and you come across this article, 15 oven mitts from Amazon that reviewers truly love. It's written in really easy to read font. There's lots of photos, uh, you know what they're talking about. And so that can be an easy processing experience. And there's lots of things that can make information feel easy or difficult. So one of the main things is familiarity. Have you seen the information before? Um, does it feel familiar? Are you aware? Is this a topic that you know about? Um, you can also think about things like, is the language easy to understand? Is it something that you're used to? And I'll talk about this just a bit more. Um, but we know with this information processing that um, when information feels easy to process, it also feels more true. So if you read something and it just feels really easy, um, you're more likely to believe that it's true. And ease of processing can be a valid cue that something is true. So if I've seen something before, if I've heard a lot about the topic, it can mean now that when something feels easy to process, that it's true because I've heard the information, lots of people believe it, it's been confirmed. But also sometimes unrelated influences can make things feel true. So something can feel true even though it's not true. And I'll give you some examples. So one example is mere repetition. So if I'm just repeating the claim, um, multiple times, it can feel more true. Let's see this animation here. It's going to put them all up at once. <laughs> um, but say I read the unicorn is the national anim animal of Scotland, I show you that multiple times. We know from a lot of studies that when you repeat information, both true information and false information, people are more likely to believe it if they've seen it before. Um, another example is print font. So we know from studies that when we write information in a font that's harder to read, people are less convinced that it's true than when it's written in a font that's easier to read. So when it feels easier, just because of the font, it can feel more true. Uh, another example is the presence of photos. So if I have a claim, this claim that you've seen before, and I just pair it with a photo that's related but doesn't give you any more information about whether the claim is true, just the presence of the photo can make it feel easier to process the claim. It's easier to imagine what I'm talking about, and that can make information seem more true. 
And there's many more fun examples of this, uh, things like when someone has an accent, it's easier to understand. If people are listening uh, with audio that is a higher quality, people find um, the people speaking to be more credible and what they're saying to be better. Um, so all of these kind of unrelated factors can influence how true information seems. Um, when looking at information source, people can carefully analyze the credibility of the information source or use their intuition. So the same way whether the, in which you evaluate whether information is true, you can also analyze whether a source is credible. And so generally people also believe information more when it comes from a familiar source, so someone that you know, or a source that feels familiar. So I'm gonna give you another example from some, some psychology studies. And so in this study, uh, the researchers gave people a claim. So like the unicorn is the national animal of Scotland. And they attributed the claim as coming from someone with a name that was easy to pronounce or someone with a name that was difficult to pronounce. And so these weren't people that the participants knew, they just were reading the names. And so Adrian Babushko would be easier to pronounce and I'm not, and Yevgeny, I'm not gonna pronounce the second one. Um, that's a more difficult to pronounce name. And when the information was attributed to coming from someone with an easier to pronounce name, people believed it more than when it was attributed to be coming from someone with a difficult to pronounce name. And the reason being when something's easier to pronounce, it feels more familiar, we trust familiar people more. And so that can seem more true. So both people that are more familiar and people that feel more familiar can make you believe the information more. Um, and then finally, a really important point is that people also believe information more when it comes from someone from their in-group. So say someone from the same political party. And so you can look to say, oh, someone that comes, that is similar to me believes something, that can be a cue that I should believe it too. And with all of these things, when the source feels familiar, um, when someone comes from the in-group, um, that can make the information seem more true. And it can also make people question the information less. So I've decided the source is trustworthy, so the information feels true. And compared to if the source doesn't feel trustworthy, I might spend more time analyzing the information coming from that source. And I'm just gonna make one last point. I've been asking, how do people decide if things are true? You can also ask, when do people consider truth? So when are people making the effort to decide if something's true or not? Often assuming the informa that information is true is the default. So when I introduced myself, you probably weren't questioning if I was lying about my name or lying about my job. You probably just assumed that I was telling you that what I was telling you was true. You didn't have a reason to question um, whether I would have a reason to lie. And so generally, unless people have a reason to question otherwise, people assume that information is true. We also know that there are many reasons why people read and share information. They don't always read and share information to get accurate information. They might share information for entertainment or to build social bonds or to feel like part of a group. So oftentimes when people share information, they don't always consider accuracy. So the question of how do people decide if something's true, the question you can also ask is when do people decide if something is true and are they considering information truth? So I'll just give you one last example. Let's see if this will go forward for me. Okay, so say you're on Twitter, you come across this nice tweet. Oh, look, someone's tweeting that it's National Unicorn Day. You might look Scottish Book Trust. Oh, they've got that nice check mark. Um, this is a fun fact. And people might not even consider, is this information true? They might just think, oh, my friends would think this is cool, so let me share it. And so when sharing information, oftentimes people may not even consider accuracy before we sharing. So now I'm gonna come back. You guys are all probably dying to know, is the unicorn the national animal of Scotland? This is indeed true. And just so you have some time to prepare, National Unicorn Day is coming up on April 9th. So now that we've talked about some reasons about how people decide information is true and when they do, I'm going to turn you over to Kate. All right, thank you, Maddie, for helping us understand sort of psychologically why we're, uh, why we're vulnerable to misinformation. And a, a point that I wanna make is that we're all vulnerable to misinformation. That includes um, you and your, and your friends and your, maybe even your parents. It includes me and 
even Matt, well, I'm not sure about Maddie, but probably Maddie too. You know, even though we know some of these things, um, we find ourselves, even this morning, I found myself, I was about to take, I was about to retweet something. And instead I took a snapshot and it turned out 15 minutes later, it wasn't true. Uh, so we're all vulnerable to this. We're especially vulnerable to, to misinformation online. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about why sort of the, the ways that we interact with content through our phones or through the internet may make us especially vulnerable to spreading misinformation and for belie into believing misinformation as well. So one of them is the speed and scale of information in the online environment. Online informa information moves much faster and farther than ever before. Um, and you know, if anyone's ever thought about what it means to go viral, within minutes you can go from having your content reaching you know a few people like. Historically, we might be able to talk to our friends at school, but now that information can echo out very quickly to your town, to the whole country, to the whole world. And so we see this, this, this ability for information to spread so quickly, to being part of um, why misinformation um, is, is, misinformation can spread that far as well as information. Another thing that happens online is that information can lose connection to where it was created. So it, become, it, can, it can spread out of context. Um, and, and so sometimes it'd be hard to figure out when or where that piece of con content began and how it got to us. And for instance, something that was true yesterday may not be true today. So a comment, I, I study disaster response. So a comment of like, you know, there's an evacuation warning. Well, if it was yesterday, that it may not be true if it's spreading today. So it just you know, can get out of place in sort of time. We also see like pictures that were taken years ago get repurposed and reshared and pretend, and some people pretend they're related to new events. And it can be hard to say, now is this a picture of, 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 a, of a bomb uh, going off in Ukraine or is this something that happened um, many, many years ago? And so um, online, it's very easy for information to sort of spread outside of the context it was created in and that contributes to misinformation. Um, another reason that we're vulnerable online is algorithms. So um, algorithms are, the, are the, 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 the computation behind what we see online. So um, because information, there's so much information that can be shared every single day in online environments, and it spreads so fast and so far that the platforms actually have to make decisions about what content we see. We don't see everything that our friends post. We don't see everything that gets posted. We only see some information. And, and these algorithms, they recommend some content and some accounts to us, and they don't recommend other content and, and accounts. And one of the problems is, is they tend to give us more of what we engage with. So things that we, that, that we watch or that we share or that we like, things that make us angry or excited, anytime we engage with that content, the computer learns that we like that content and the algorithm gives us more of that content. And this can lead us into echo chambers and down rabbit holes. And it also can lead, lead us into that repetition thing that Maggie talked about. We can get more and more content that maybe echoes something that we, we saw once and was false. Well, now we get that three, three or four more times. This is actually particularly problematic in platforms like TikTok, where just watching a video or lingering a little longer on one video rather than another means that we're going to get more videos like that. And that's going to contribute to that repetition effect that Maddie talked about. Another thing, and I, I mentioned this above, so I want to explain it. Another thing that happens online is, is that we can get into echo chambers. And we often interact online with people who share our same political or social identities. In the real world, we have to go to school, we have to interact with people, and, and geography determines what we see. But in the online world, often it's these other choices that we make. And what can happen is when we're only seeing content by people who share our political and social identities, is these can reinforce that sort of false sense of social consensus, or this idea that like other people think, other people that I care about think the same thing that I do. And so we can get into this, these, these places that, that we call echo chambers. This image is actually of, of tweets that were sent in 2016 about a highly political conversation. And tweets on the, on the left, and actually each little, each little ball here is a, is a Twitter account. And the accounts tend to cluster together here if they retweeted each other and they're further apart if they didn't retweet each other. We can actually see from our, some of our data analysis that the structure of these online environments creates these echo chambers where people on, on one political side here, the left is like um, 
sort of liberal or Democrat Democrat kind of uh, people, they're retweeting each other, and the right is is conservative or Republican accounts, and they're retweeting each other, and they're and they're not they're not you know kind of listening across the divides. They're all kind of staying within their echo chambers. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. Another piece here is that online, a lot of our our uh, our um, accounts or our content tends to reflect some of our political and social identities. If you go on, on Twitter or Facebook, you might see people putting hashtags into their um, accounts to let other people know what their politics are. Well, this means when we encounter content, we often encounter it with a social identity wrapped around it. And instantly we can see, hey, you know, this person thinks like me, maybe I'm gonna believe them, or this person looks like someone on the other political side, I don't believe anything they're gonna say. Well, that can actually create conditions that would make us more vulnerable to misinformation because we're often more vulnerable to spreading things that align with what we believe, as opposed to content that may conflict with what we believe, where it's really easy to reject that and say that's misinformation, but it's harder to see misinformation when it's dressed up um, in a social wrapper of someone that we think is someone like us. So one of the things, another things that happens is around disinformation. So disinformation is a kind of misinformation that's intentional, where people are trying to manipulate what we think about the world. So they're, uh, they're uh, either lying to us, they're misleading us in some way. And what happens in online environments is disinformation, disinformers have a new ability to reach us. They can, they can find us, they can get into our communities, they can talk to us, uh, and they can manipulate, manipulate us and interact with us in new ways that was harder before we had these online environments. And they can also hide. Because we lose context, because it's hard to know online whether someone is who they say they are, um, we get this situation where people that want to disinform us can actually start looking like someone we care about. If they just put the right hashtags in their profile, well, that looks like someone who thinks like me. Uh, and, and they understand that they, how to do that. So we see this with what we call inauthentic actors, who people who pretend they're someone else. Um, they usually pretend they're someone that we, that we identify with, um, and they can use that to mislead us. So this is that same graph I told you from 2016, and it had, you know, left-leaning people on the left and right-leaning people on the right, and it's a retweet network graph. Well, what I've overlaid here was actually, um, we, uh, with the help of Twitter and some other folks, we, the, we were able to identify um, who uh, Russia at that time was running information operations using inauthentic actors who were, they were called Russian trolls, but they were operating accounts where they pretended to be Americans and they tried to manipulate our political conversation in 2016. And they actually infiltrated into groups, both on the political right and on the political left. And they dressed up in accounts that looked just like us. Um, on the left, they, they pretended to be Black Lives Matter activists or um, Democrats who cared about environment. On the right, they, they pretended to be Trump supporters or people that were very supportive of guns or the Second Amendment. And they infiltrated our, our, our communities and they manipulated us from within those communities. And that, and in part, they couldn't do that in real life. They couldn't come to your school and pretend to be one of your friends, but they can do that online. And so this is, this we're newly vulnerable in these online envir environments. And again, I wanna remind you that we were all vulnerable to misinformation. And particularly in a moment like this, we've got things happening that are happening, happening around the world that are very, um, it, we've got COVID, we've got conflict uh, and invasion and in, uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. And we are, you know, we're going to be seeing information about this in our environments. And just to kind of keep in mind that we're, we're vulnerable to misinformation and there's a danger in spreading misinformation, um, especially in these highly volatile co contexts and, and it can actually undermine democracy. So um, just want to encourage us to, to understand this and try to see what we can do um, to, to be healthier participants in these online spaces. All right, and with that, we're gonna talk about what you can do um, for those of you, especially that are in online spaces, and many of you may not be, um, which is also great. I recommend staying that way as long as you can. But for those of you who are using social media or your friends or family are using social media, um, here's some things that you or they can do to, um, 
to be healthier participants in these environments. Maddie? Yeah, so one of the main, main things that you can do is just slow down a little bit. Um, and so when you're going through things fast, you, you, that's when you primarily rely on feelings. You don't have enough time to carefully analyze things. So just taking a minute to slow down and not just go with, oh, this feels right, but think about, does this feel right, um, is a tip that's relatively easy and something that you can uh, do anytime. Um, something else you can do is just uh, consider the information accuracy. So before you share something, instead of just thinking, oh, this is a good thing to share, you can just ask yourself, is this information true? And just taking that second to just ask that question and consider accuracy before you're sharing um, is a good way to make sure that uh, it not you're not going to catch every piece of misinformation, but to be more likely to catch things that could be false. Another piece is to tune into your emotional responses. One of the things that we find with misin misinformation doesn't spread itself. People spread it. And, we, and often we spread misinformation when we are emotionally aroused. That's what gets us to engage with content. We're more likely engage, to engage with content if it's funny, if it makes us laugh, or it makes us angry, or makes us sad. And so tune into your emotional responses. Often when someone's trying to manipulate us to spread misinformation or disinformation, it's through our emotional responses. And sometimes it's legitimate. You're mad for a good reason and you wanna share content and that's okay. But to kind of just reflect of like, am I mad? Is this, is this trying to make me mad so I'll share it? That's usually a good, a good signal for you to just, again, just to slow, slow down and maybe double check before you share anything. We can also use the SIFT methods to verify information. I think you're all gonna see more about SIFT and some of the other content with Misinfo Day, but that's a, a set of like just some, some, some simple things that you can do to help kind of verify that the information you're seeing is, is true or, or is probably true before you spread it. And also to just kind of learn and think about the signs of manipulation. And again and again, we come back to this idea that we're all vulnerable and it's okay that we sometimes make mistakes. People are gonna make mistakes, but I think accepting that we're vulnerable makes us a little bit more resilient to misinformation and hopefully can help us um, prevent and, and stop it from spreading. All right, thank you all for being here today and, and good luck with your, with your uh, coursework today and I hope uh, I hope you've learned something. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.